Uh, what I'd like to do today is lay out the elements of the current consensus among central bankers about the importance of inflation expectations. If nothing else, if I can restate this received wisdom, it could identify some gaps and weaknesses that could set directions for the research of people like those who are attending this conference. I am, of course, uh, aware of the revisionist movement that questions whether inflation expectations are, in fact, important for determining uh, inflation uh, and for setting monetary policy. This, uh, this new literature is impressive in its scope and ambition. For example, the work of Olivier Kobian, Yuri Gorodnichenko, and others underscores a point that I and many of my former colleagues have long suspected that most households and firms pay little attention to central bank announcements and targets, at least during normal times. As uh, my Princeton colleague, Alan Blinder, once observed, many ordinary Americans, at least at one time, thought that the Federal Reserve was some sort of national park. Likewise, in a revisionist vein, Jeremy Rudd, in a paper, well-publicized paper, which I think you're gonna hear this afternoon, has questioned standard hypotheses about the causal links between inflation and inflation expectations. For example, as Jeremy's pointed out, low unionization rates and the resulting paucity of formal cost of living agreements reduce the linkages between price and wage inflation in the United States. This new research is welcome, and I will confess, and I've read a lot of it, but certainly not all of it, but I will confess that as an ex-central banker, I still have some sympathy for the conventional view of the role of inflation expectations in policymaking. What I'd like to do is set up maybe the straw man, but I'd like to set up that uh, argument today. Uh, the conventional story, uh, again, which is dominant uh, in central banks around the world, uh, rests on two key premises. First, that inflation expectation, I'll talk later about whose inflation expectations, are an important determinant of realized inflation. In particular, uh, inflation expectations help to determine inflation dynamics, including the persistence of shocks to inflation and the sensitivity of inflation to other economic variables. The second key premise is that central bank behavior and possibly central bank communications can influence infl inflation expectations and through them, macroeconomic outcomes. In particular, achieving through word and deed what are often called well-anchored inflation expectations can lead to better policy outcomes overall. If inflation expectations are well-anchored in the sense that they don't respond very much to short-term movements in realized inflation and other variables, then policymakers can respond more aggressively to recessionary demand shocks and less aggressively to inflationary supply shocks, leading to better dual mandate outcomes. As the critics point out, this conventional story is hard to prove. Inflation expectations are not easy to measure. Indeed, while we're happy to write down pi super e in our models, we know that in principle, no, even in principle, no single measure of expectations could possibly capture the range of people's beliefs about prices. Moreover, it's difficult to distinguish whether inflation expectations as measured have a causal effect on inflation or are merely inflation forecasts, and generally not very good ones at that. Nevertheless, the history of US inflation since the 1960s seems to fit the conventional story reasonably well, which is why it's had such influence on policymakers' thinking. In the mid-1960s, Milton Friedman and Edmund Phelps made their famous out-of-sample forecast that the Phillips curve would move upward as inflation psychology took hold. Their argument was, based on what in retrospect seems an elementary point, that in the longer term, workers and firms can distinguish real from nominal wage increases. Inflation no doubt has second order effects. If it didn't, we wouldn't care about it. As Andrew Levin and John Taylor showed some years ago, the limited inflation expectations that we do have for the great inflation era seem consistent with the idea that expectations in the 1970s have become unanchored and unstable. In particular, observed expectation proxies responded strongly and persistently to what were intrinsically temporary inflation shocks, such as the two big oil shocks and the removal of the Nixon wage price controls. Fed Chair Arthur Burns, a uh, former predecessor of Jim Paterba at the NBER, uh, in a valedictory speech entitled The Anguish of Central Banking, blamed the great inflation primarily on three factors, 
First, a political consensus against anti-inflation policies if those policies reduced uh, employment. Second, a significant underestimation by policymakers at the time of the natural rate of unemployment, a point later emphasized by Athanasios or Finides. And critically, the emergence of a broad inflation psychology that made inflation self-propagating and could not be controlled except at great cost. Burns's hypothesis that inflation psychology would prove hard to control once out of hand was tested and confirmed by Paul Volcker, whose conquest of inflation was, as we know, accompanied by a deep recession. Volcker understood the potential importance for expectations of signaling a break in inflation policy as evidenced by his opportunistic switch to monetarist operating principles at the famous October 1979 meeting of the Federal Market Committee. Ken Rogoff once wrote about the importance of central bankers projecting a tough hawkishness as Volcker tried to do. Volcker's efforts to manage inflation expectations were at best partially credible, however, as a deep decline in, in employment was not avoided when policy tightened. As Marvin Goodfriend and Robert King have documented, however, the rise in unemployment in the 1980s was notably less than predicted by Keynesian economists like Arthur Oaken in advance using standard Phillips curve models, suggesting the presence of at least some credibility benefits. Moreover, Volcker's demonstration of resolve, together with the continued efforts of Alan Greenspan, appear to have anchored inflation expectations somewhere between 2 and 3% by the early 1990s. This anchoring helped Greenspan engineer a soft landing after the 1991 recession and achieved sustained growth without inflation during the famous 1996 Maestro episode. Volcker and Greenspan's anchoring of inflation also corresponds to the so-called Great Moderation Period, which began in the mid-80s and was disrupted in 2007, not by inflation, but of course by a major financial crisis. From the 1950s through 1990, Fed efforts to control inflation were perhaps the single most important cause of recessions. Now, of course, we'll see what happens in the next year or two as the Fed contends with a major inflation shock. But since 1990, with inflation more often too low than too high, Fed tightenings have generally played a much more modest role in triggering downturns. So this is all storytelling, but this narrative has greatly influenced thinking at all major central banks. More formal evidence is generally consistent with the stories, however. For example, Jim Stock and Mark Watson showed that inflation since the 1960s can be modeled as the sum of a permanent component and a transitory component, a so-called trend cycle model. As they showed, the variance of the transitory component has not changed much over time but the variance of shocks to the permanent component rose significantly during the great inflation era, then declined nearly to zero after Volcker. In other words, inflation, which was dominated by a random walk component in the 1970s, has over the past 30 years or so become a stationary process around a stable mean. This is consistent with inflation expectations having become well anchored since the 1980s. Follow on research has documented similar patterns in other advanced economies. Other work, notably a 2002 paper by Mark Hooker, has found that inflation in the post-Volcker period has been only transitorily affected by short-term shocks in prices to prices, such as oil price shocks or shifts in exchange rates. During my time as chair, that prediction seemed borne out by the fact that $140 barrel oil in 2008 and above $100 oil in 2011 and, and later did not persistently raise inflation, although I am aware of work arguing that higher oil prices reduced what otherwise would have been a decline in core inflation after the financial crisis. As work by John Roberts has shown, another key empirical regularity, the so-called flattening of the Phillips curve, may best be explained not by structural changes in the economy, but by well-anchored inflation expectations, which result in inflation being less responsive to other macro variables, including unemployment. This finding is closely related to work by Marco McLeay and Silvana Tenreiro, which in the recent macro annual, who show that when inflation is controlled and inflation expectations are well anchored, estimated Phillips curves will primarily reflect cost shocks and will not be informative about the true slope of the trade-off between inflation and unemployment. So let me return now to two questions raised by the recent research. First, whose inflation expectations are we talking about when we use the term? And second, what are the specific mechanisms by which inflation expectations actually influence inflation? <laughs> 
Staff at the Federal Reserve Board, when constructing measures of inflation expectations, tend to rely on three sources, outside professional forecasters, tips, break-evens, or other financial indicators like inflation swaps, and surveys of households and firms. Each of these sources has its drawbacks. Professional forecasters typically use the same models and frameworks as the Fed does, casting doubt on the amount of extra information that they provide. Financial indicators are contaminated by various liquidity and risk premia. Measures of inflation expectations based on surveys show a variety of biases. For example, they vary systematically by demographic group. It doesn't really help to average these three types of indicators, as the Fed's new common inflation expectations indicator does, because their properties and their biases are so different. When I was a policymaker, consistent with recent research, I tended to group expectations into those held by, quote, attentive agents and those of inattentive agents, with professional forecasters and market participants in the first group and households and businesses in the second. At least until recently, central bank communications were aimed primarily at the attentive group. By the way, an interesting fact is that the Fed's Furbus model of the economy has two settings. In one, only attentive market participants are assumed to respond to policy announcements, with inattentive households and firms forming beliefs purely adaptively. In the second variant, everyone, including households and businesses, knows and understand the Fed's plans. Not surprisingly, policy simulations using the first assumption are usually taken more seriously. Doubtless, the attentive group, professional forecasters and market participants, respond sensitively to central bank communication and recently even to the chair's facial expressions as evaluated by AI programs. That's what I was referring to when I once said that monetary policy is 98% talk and 2% action. For the attentive group, beliefs about inflation are important to monetary transmission in large part because they help determine expectations not only about inflation, but also about policy. When the Fed announced this new Flexible Average Inflation Targeting Framework, or FAIT, in 2020, for example, inflation expectations in financial markets rose as intended. But market participants inferred that to achieve higher inflation, the Fed would have to allow easier financial conditions for longer. These easier financial conditions, lower mortgage rates and higher stock prices, for example, no doubt affected the behavior of people who never heard of the Federal Reserve and had no idea what the current inflation rate was. The direct effects of the central bank's words and deeds on inattentive agents is more complicated and is a subject of much current research. As the recent literature has suggested, it's useful to think of there being two regimes. In low inflation regimes, consistent with Alan Greenspan's definition of price stability as inflation so low that households and businesses ignore it when making decisions, inattentive agents don't distinguish between relative price changes and changes in the general price level. In this regime, the relationship between survey measures of, actual, of inflation expectations and actual inflation is quite loose. However, when inflation is high and thus more salient, people and businesses pay much closer attention. Even if they don't know what the CPI is, they know the prices of the things they buy, or for businesses, the prices of their output and input, including labor. Some go so far as to read or listen to news stories about inflation or to tell pollsters that they are unhappy about it. So when, inf in when inflation is high, average people, the inattentive agents, know about it. The tougher question relevant to macroeconomic modeling and policy is whether normally inattentive agents can make reasonable guesses about how long a given burst of inflation is likely to last. The difference between recent median term inflation expectations and the same expectations in the 1970s suggests that people do think about inflation persistence. People now, unlike in the 1970s, as best we can tell, apparently think that inflation will decline in the next few years. Moreover, the views of consumers, firms, and workers about persistence affect the ability of sellers, including workers, to push through higher prices and the willingness of buyers to accept them rather than to shop around. In short, it may be that increases in what could be called local inflation expectations through an averaging process lead to higher and possibly more persistent inflation in the aggregate. That is the inflation psychology that Arthur Burns talked about, but as I suggested, from a modeling perspective, there are many details to work out. 
So what does all this mean for monetary policy? The obvious lesson is the familiar one that central banks should try to anchor inflation expectations at a low level. The specific anchoring point, the inflation target, is not important for inattentive agents, although it matters a lot for communication with attentive market participants. In practice, low and well-anchored expectations mean that inflation is not salient for inattentive agents. As the past 30 years suggest, when there is no inflation psychology, inflation becomes less persistent and less sensitive to temporary shocks like oil price increases, allowing the central bank greater flexibility to push for maximum employment. The Fed's FATE framework should be seen as an attempt to firmly anchor inflation expectations at the 2% target, compensating for persistent undershoots of the target with temporary overshoots. Uh, the Fed will also pay close attention to inflation expectations as it determines now how aggressively it should fight this recent burst in inflation. What should a central bank do if inflation expectations deviate significantly from target? As the Volcker experience showed, if, if a strong inflation psychology prevails, there be, may be no way to avoid a painful trade-off of inflation and growth, although it's worth trying to influence expectations if possible. And of course, credibility earned by controlling inflation in the past can help. If inflation expectations are too low, as has long been the case in Japan, the central bank may find it difficult to create more inflation, at least without substantial help from fiscal policy. Historically, when inflation and inflation, inflation expectations are very far from target, the best hope of gaining control without crushing the economy may be a regime change that creates a visible shift in inflation fundamentals. To cite the historical examples, the Weimar hyperinflation was quickly ended by a foreign loan and a delay in reparations requirements that restored fiscal sustainability in Germany. The U.S. deflation of the early 1930s was reversed in a matter of months by Roosevelt's abandonment of the gold parity. Unfortunately, true regime change appear to be rare and difficult to engineer. I'd hoped that the introduction of Abenomics in 2013 would look enough like a regime change to move inflation expectations up, but despite enormous effort by the Bank of Japan, that hasn't happened. Moving inflation expectations significantly, especially after they've been displaced by long experience as in Japan or 1970s America, can be extraordinarily difficult. I take these experiences as supporting the priority that modern central bankers place on keeping inflation and inflation expectations well anchored near the target. Incidentally, it may be that the beginning and prospective end of the current pandemic uh, is being thought of as a regime change by the public. As I noted, people appear to expect less persistence of inflation than usual, consistent with built up Fed credibility, but also with a general belief that the pandemic era is extraordinary and that once it ends, the world will look more like it did before. If measured medium term inflation expectations remain moderate despite high current inflation, and if the real cost of restoring price stability ends up being less than in earlier episodes, that would be some evidence in favor of the received view that stable inflation expectations have significant benefits. I'll stop there. 